to the beautiful home of David and Dina Reese. Welcome everybody. Dina's not here. Um, thank you all for coming. We're so happy to have Abraham Sutton again, even though he's leaving tonight. Hopefully he's going to be back more often during the year. He's working with some beautiful people from Queens. Benny is going to help him out. There's some great books working here, so a lot more books coming out. I'd also like to thank Eric Targan for helping publicize the event. And uh, let's see what I might do. Uh, my name is David Schwecki. I run ExcitingJudaism.com. You can uh, subscribe to my website to get on the email list to tell you what Avraham is going to be. I also put on 50 events a year all over the city. Thank you so much for coming. Many say a few words. Yes, uh, just to introduce the new book, Henry Avraham Sun, Spiritual Technology. Uh, this, this whole pro progress here in the, in the one week, two weeks that he's been here is in memory of um, Nisan Ben Shimon and Shira Nitzchakov. Uh, uh, we want to give thanks to your super family for making this happen. Uh, we also want to thank the company for making the printing also happen. At the same time, we had a great time with Rabbi Avram for the two weeks. And the CDs are for free, give outs, and the books are available for purchasing after the show. Thank you very much again. The rabbi is going to leave at about, he's going to stop speaking at about 8.45. Then maybe we'll sign some books, but he has to leave here. What is what is time? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Nine and ten. Nine and ten to, to go straight to Yerushalayim. Oh, you fly from here. Skipping the airport. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can actually put it, we can make our initial lift off here. That's what this that's what this is for. The, the, the transition from the subtitle of my book, the subtitle of Spiritual Technology, is on the transition from profane technology to sacred technology in preparation for the advent of the Great Sabbath. So profane technology is the starts with simple things. Noah invents the, uh, the plow. He brings menucha. He brings, he brings a certain amount of respite to the world because... He extends the human hand into a plow in order, in, in order to make life easier. And then we begin the whole thing with the Iron Age and things of people making all kinds of things that will now make life easier, right? And make civilization. Basically, civilization is the unfolding. And it's, it's, com it's completely hand in hand. It's a parallel development. It is the development of technology. As one nation or civilization develops, a particular technology, then it uses that to conquer a neighboring nation, and uh, that's how it that's how it unfolds. So this book is about how the downward thrust of history, based on based on profane technology, based on extending ourselves into physicality and developing technologies based on things that are really intrinsic to our being. Of course. I based myself initially in this terms of this particular idea in terms of on, on, on Marshall McLuhan. I uh, I quote him in the book. He was a profound. Under, he had a profound understanding that every new technology changes your sense ratios. It changes not the way you think. It changes the way you perceive the world. You don't even know what it's like to perceive a, a child born nowadays doesn't know what it's like not to have an iPhone, right? Or, or something, you know. That, it's like you can take it for granted. You don't know what... It, how do you even exist in a world that doesn't have these things? So the Torah, I'm saying, is a, a repository for a, an older way of looking at the world. And that's why many people will say, well, like the Torah, like it's ancient, like it's archaic, what do you need it for? Yes, precisely because of that we need it. Because it, it preserves a level of consciousness that preceded this type of development. It takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Sir, it, it's in metaphorical terms. We have to break through the external facade of the Torah, of the story, into the deeper meaning. But it's there, it's there for us to do. I do a little bit of that in this book, okay. I mean, I have, there's much more, there's only so much that we can understand about the Garden of Eden. But it's time to start it, at least. As, one of the, as two of the great teachers said, the Ramchal and the Leshem. And the Leshem is mentioned in here, and I explain who he is a little bit, but, put, but just for the moment, the Leshem is, a, is the name of a Sefer by 
a great rabbi who was born in 1840, 1841. I call him a tar baby. Because in Hebrew, <laughs> Tafresh is the year 5600. And in, in, in the Gregorian calendar, it came out as 1839-1840. Well, he was conceived in Tar in 1839. He was born in 1841, whatever. So he was a master of Sod, of Kabbalah. He was in the tradition, the school of the Gon of Vilna, but he was all over. He was, his, it's his explanations of Zohar, of Midrash, of the Talmud, of the entire system. He opens up things. He lived into 1926 through the actual revolution in, in, in relativity and special theory. He didn't know those things. He was just doing the same thing in Torah, parallel. He was doing the same thing in Torah that the master scientists and mathematicians of the turn of the 19th century, the turn of the 20th century, were doing. He was doing in Torah what they were doing in physics. So the Leshem and the Ramchal both, both say it. The trees were trees, the people were people, the fruit were fruit, but they weren't the fruit that we know, the people that we know, and the, and the trees that we know. He explains in an incredible piece here of how Hashem made the world in a, in a devolving, a devolving downward fashion. And uh, I'd like to read it to you. It's one of the most um, beautiful pieces that I know. I have to admit that I did not prepare the page beforehand because I'm moving with you as I go into this. But this is what I, need, I know I need to read to you and share with you. Should be on page 195. We did all kinds of indexes, indices, to this book to make it easy to find it in all kinds of numbers of ways. There's a glossary, there's a subject inject, there's a rabbinical index, a secular quotes index. Let's see if I find it. No, it's not that hard. Okay. All right, so I'll just give it over to you. The level of Eden, he says, was so much beyond anything we can imagine. The Torah speaks in physical language, or at least seems to. And this is an incredible point. I want everybody to really get this. The Torah uses words like etz, tree. It uses all kinds of words that we're familiar with. And so the initial, the initial understanding we have of the Torah, oh, oh, it's talking about a tree. Oh, it's talking about an anan, a cloud. It's talking about ash, a fire. Right? We were in the desert and there was an Anan, there was an Esh. Oh, it must be like what we're familiar with. A cloud, right? God comes down in a cloud and he stands there with Moses. But then we ask ourselves, wait a second, what do you mean? God doesn't come down in a cloud and stand there with Moses? It must have been a prophetic vision. And there's all kinds of levels within the Torah. Its simplistic external facade is purposely, it's, it, 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 if you think about it, doesn't make sense. Yes, it says. Right, you're right, it doesn't make sense. There's something deeper here. So in the Garden of Eden especially, all the more so, what's going on? Adam was not a man as we know him. Eve was not a woman as we know her. The level of reality was in a whole different level of dim dimensionality. And so he takes us up into Eden which is in a sense Yitzira, but it's even that, it's not even that. And we don't, even, we don't know what Yitzira is, but we know that it's the dimension immediately above us. But Eden really spans Yitzira and Bria. It goes up very high, and in fact, perhaps even part of Atzilut. The higher the worlds, the more refined. We're not talking about physical world. We're talking about something that we only have physical words to describe but it's talking about something beyond. The Mashiach will tell us what the Torah really means. In the meantime, 
we just have, in a sense, a broken, as- a broken aspect or a broken understanding of the Torah. But at least knowing that makes the difference. Knowing that what we see with the words that we see and the understandings that we have, there's so much more there. And so the idea is to go inside. To enter at least through the words. Or if not through the words, at least through what the words suggest to us. Through the spaces in the words. Right? If you want to say like the words are, are a three-dimensional world, so the letters already get us to a deeper level, a vibrational level. When we say the words and we think about them, they open up to us like a flower, like a tree. We need our teachers for this also. The main point here was that Hashem made the world in a descending fashion where there become more and more garments. The word that's used in Kabbalah is there's livushim. Hashem creates the world of, in contractions of the light where there's less light and more that the light coalesces into garments, into vessels. And our job is to see from the outside down here to see that there's an inner level. And our job eventually is to so, see so much through the outer level that we are able to, that the actually, the outer level begins to vibrate at a higher level, at a higher vibrational level. And the example I give is that when you see a tzaddik eat, and when you see a regular person like myself or any of us here eat, and when you see a child eat. We're all eating, we're all doing a physical act. With the tzaddik, if we can imagine, if you've imagined, if you've met anybody who's a little bit higher, sometimes in Yerushalayim you can meet one, sometimes in New York maybe you can meet one, a woman, a man, they've developed themselves, sometimes their skin is almost like baby-like, they don't have any trips, they don't have any illusions that they're trying to put on you, they just have a certain beauty to them. So when they eat, what can we see right away without even looking too deeply is there, there's a thought process behind the eating. It's not just a physical thing. So we're we're seeing that inside there there's something happening and that's really what's happening. The external fact of eating is really just because we're all physical, but inside what we're looking for is develop our inner world. So as we develop our inner world, we can develop our ability to see through and past the facades that physical reality presents to us. So again, now, the world is made in such a way that it was layered. Our job is to see through the layers. Okay, that's part one. Part two. And that, and that the metaphor of energy, of a higher vibrational level, is what is a good metaphor for understanding that when we start to see through, then we'll start to see that matter is really a, is, a, is an energetic form. E equals mc squared. That or with an ein means skin. It means matter, physical matter. But or with an aleph is light. And so that transition from or to ein, or with an aleph to or with an ein, from light and energy to matter, we reverse it. We begin to see through the outer facade, through the outer shell. The outer shell is very important because we have to live in the physical world. But it's begin- the time is coming when it's time now to start to see that there's something behind. That nothing happens in the physical world without a spiritual, a spiritual motive, motive or a spiritual initiator. And we can see the spiritual up there, or we can see the spiritual actually indwelling, permeating the physical. My favorite parable of the Baal Shem Tov Amazing parable about a king who wanted to build a palace and it would have rooms, incredible rooms in it with wisdom and with art with everything you could ever want and outside of the palace there would be gardens and mazes and then outside of that would be circles of walls and, and, and ministers of, of the king and also soldiers of the king and also animals, fierce animals and moats. The farther out you'd go, the more difficult it would be to get in. And the king made this palace and he invited all of the 
all of the people of, the, of, of, the, of his kingdom to come to see him. And he was going to be in the throne room in the middle. And yet when they got there, there's different versions, like uh, there's seven versions I found, and I've translated all of them, and I share them. Right now we're just giving you a complex, or a, 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 mixed, a mixed version of the Val Shem Tov's meta, uh, parable. He's sitting in the throne room. He's there in the middle. He's surrounded by an incredible palace. Again, as I said, ministers. And the Degel Machne Ephraim, the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, he says that the ministers are strewing Kesef and Zahab, silver and gold. Anybody can come and take it. But again, even to get there, you have to go through the mazes. You have to go over the walls. You have to go through the moats. You have to go past the alligators. And therefore, there are fewer and fewer as you get closer and closer to the palace. And then those who get into the palace, if there's even one of us, and it really has to be each one of us, but there's one of us, and we're in the palace, and the rooms are awesome, and you can sit in a room and have all the wisdom in the world at your fingertips. And yet you know that's not the reason you came here. You came here to see the king. So not only the negative diversions, but even the positive things are diversions to stop us from getting to the king. And finally, when we do get to the throne room, the Baal Shem Tov says, it's so awesome to be in the presence of the king. There's still a certain distance where at the door the king is there, like Esther coming in to see Ahasuerus. But we see and the king tells us, come forward, come towards him. And we bow and we come towards him. And the king and the queen perhaps also are sitting there. Tell us what it was like to get here. It was so hard. I had to go through so much. I was broken a million times. I didn't think I could get here. And then the good stuff also, the negative and the positive, the animals, the frightening animals, the terror that I felt, and also the good things that I could have taken the money and gone. But all I wanted to do was to see you, to be with you. So the king says, now I want you to turn around. And from here I want you to see what the palace looks like. And do you know the parable? So he looks, and there's no palace. And there's only incredible, endless endless gardens and, and angelic beings. And he looks at the king, he looks at the queen, and he says, what happened? What's going on? And the king says, I had to make it like that. But I was with you at every moment. Because really the palace is an optical illusion. The world is an optical illusion. From the inside you understand that there's only the endlessness of the creator. I want you to leave now. Stay here with me for a while. This is the Kriyat Shema. This is the Amidah. This is in terms of our prayer system. This was incorporated into our prayer system. He's basing himself on powerful ideas that are already there. It's just the parable brings it out. The parable gives us the, the way of understanding. Wow, look what they gave to us. When they, say, when they gave us Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. When they gave us Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Elokeinu Hashem Echad. When they gave us Hashem, Sabatai Tiftach, Ufi, Yagiti, Latecha. Baruch atah Hashem, Magen Abraham. Baruch atah Hashem, Ma Mahazir Shkin Atol Tzion. There's so much depth there. So the Baal Shem Tov's parable encompasses all that. And we stay there. The ability to stay there, the patience to stay there. Nothing has to happen. It's not a place of becoming. It's not a place of doing. It's a place of being. And that's what most of us are not even used to. Because the society we live in, the technological form that's given to us, has taken us outside of ourselves. We perceive ourselves mostly, most of us, halavai, not all of us, right? 